Hey everyone! Today I want to talk about my favorite snaggletooth dinosaur. It's called the Dilophosaurus, a notorious predator from the early Jurassic, who, let's just say, has had its fair share of monster movie magic. Okay, Napkin, you can stop right there. I've already heard all about how the Jurassic Park franchise completely fabricated that fabulous neck frill, as well as the Dilophosaurus's ability to spit poison at its prey. I know. This video isn't about the mistakes made in Jurassic Park. Believe it or not, Hollywood isn't the only one who's taken some creative licensing with Dilophosaurus. Over the years, paleontologists have also had to make some educated assumptions, and it should come to no surprise that many of those initial assumptions are now outdated. Thankfully, science isn't stagnant, and our friend here was recently reevaluated, and it's completely changed what we know about this animal. So today, we're taking a look at the history of Dilophosaurus and discovering where we got it wrong. Don't forget to hit that like button, and let's dive into this. The year is 1942, and all eyes are on Europe. Wait, that can't be right. Nothing important could have possibly been going on in Europe in the 1940s. No, no. The place to be was Arizona, where paleontologist Charles Camp has just discovered a large theropod dinosaur in an area known as the Cayenta Formation. The animal appears to be 7 meters in length and 2 meters in height. Only, there are a few problems. For starters, there's not one skeleton, there's three. And they weren't discovered by Camp. They were discovered two years earlier by a Navajo man named Jesse Williams. Oh, and they're missing most of their heads, but more about that later. It's the Navajo's role in this discovery I want to talk about first. Imagine your reaction to finding a bunch of dinosaur fossils in your backyard. If you're like me, then you probably envisioned yourself as Dr. Grant, brushing away the dirt to reveal the animal skeleton. This could be the find of a lifetime, and all that's left is for us to dig it up and get it out of the ground. Now, if this fantasy crossed your mind as well, then you also have a vastly different worldview from the Navajo people. For them, the act of excavating remains deeply conflicts with their ideology. According to the Navajo creation story, the Dene Bahane, I am so sorry if I butchered that name, the world used to be filled with large monsters who terrorized people wherever they went. Eventually, the monsters were slain and their bodies were buried beneath the earth. The remains of these creatures are sacred to the culture of the Navajo, and they play an important role in some of their rituals. So the act of allowing paleontologists to dig up fossils on their land is a pretty big deal, and we owe the Navajo people a great deal of thanks for working with us to discover these animals. But let's go ahead and get back to the star of this video. As I was saying, here we have three specimens. Um, are you sure about that? Of course. One, two, three. If you say so, that third one's looking pretty rough. Don't worry about that one. Let's just focus on this one right here. This first set of remains was discovered mostly intact, only missing in the front part of its skull and bits of the rib and backbone. After the excavation, the fossils were reconstructed and put on display using parts of similar theropods to fill in the gaps of the missing skeleton. The animal was then classified as a new species of Megalosaurus. Wait, what? Megalosaurus? What kind of trashy name is that? Now you're getting it. Megalosaurus is what's known as a wastebasket for taxonomy. When we have a group of similar animals, but we don't have enough information to classify them, we sort of group them together until we have enough data to classify them properly. Aw oh, man, how long's that gonna take? We already did it. Oh, thank God. In 1964, Samuel Wells returned to the area where the first three specimens were found and discovered an even larger specimen with a more complete skull. If we take a closer look at the skull, we can see the beginnings of what looked like two small head crests. And thus, we gave the name Di, two, Lophos, crest, saurus, lizard, Dilophosaurus, or two crest lizard. The discovery of this specimen provided paleontologists with a much better picture of how this animal lived. The skull was long and slender with a strange gap in its upper jaw meaning it probably couldn't have a strong bite, right? The animal was sleekly built with strong arms and a long tail. And that's it. We're done. Go ahead and add Dilophosaurus to the long list of theropods who are not named T-Rex and wait for it to slowly be forgotten. All right, the movie. By now, it's probably common knowledge that the Dilophosaurus didn't possess a neck frill it could shake and rattle to scare off predators, nor did it blind its prey by spitting poison out of its mouth. Both of these adaptations would have been preserved in the fossil record either through holes in the teeth or a skeletal support structure for the frill, similar to what we see in the skeletons of frill lizards. But ask yourself, why did the filmmakers choose to add those features into the movie? Because it's awesome? Okay, that's fair, but think about it. They could have come up with all sorts of wacky physical features not preserved in the fossil record. However, Jurassic Park is decently accurate for its time. I mean, compared to the other dinosaur media at the time, I think they did a pretty good job. So then, why do they take so much creative liberty with Dilophosaurus? The short answer is because they wanted to make a point about how bringing back extinct animals was unpredictable, and how you would discover new things not preserved in the fossil record. But that's not the full picture. There's a lot more to it than that. Dilophosaurus was discovered 50 years before the film, and in that time, aside from the discovery of the specimen in 1964, the Dilophosaurus hadn't been properly re-described. 
which I guess isn't so bad. I mean, it's not like our understanding of dinosaurs has changed much in the past few years. Oh, right. Because Dilophosaurus was described as having a weak jaw and needing to rely on its hands for attacking prey, it was thought that Dilophosaurus was a bit of a wimp. In fact, just look at him. He probably lets the larger theropods hunt for his food and then scavenges the leftovers. Oh, wait, it says here that Dilophosaurus was one of the largest theropods of the early Jurassic. It must have been difficult to kill its prey with that scrawny looking jaw. How did it do it? <gasps> Maybe it used the poison. Of course not. As I've already stated, this is a complete fabrication, but the image of Dilophosaurus as this long linking hunter with a weak jaw and two crests on its head is what led the filmmakers to take those creative leaps. Hmm, you know what? With all this newfound interest in Dilophosaurus, maybe it's time to give this animal a fresh look. Enter Adam Marsh and Timothy Rowe. Marsh and Rowe are two paleontologists who set out to reevaluate Dilophosaurus, and in 2020, they published their redescription of this fantastic dinosaur. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. A dinosaur discovered in the 1940s is getting a second look? Let me guess, it's stronger and faster than we originally thought. And you're right. One of the first things that Marsh and Rowe noticed was that the muscle attachment for the lower jaw was larger than previously thought. Meaning, Dilophosaurus was quite the muncher. Speaking of munching, let's get to the meat and potatoes. If you're like me, when you think of Dilophosaurus, you imagine it looking something like this. A medium-sized theropod with two symmetric crests resting on the top of its head. These crests give it that distinctive look we all know and love. But since we're giving this dinosaur a second look, we should probably look at other skulls to get a better idea of what these actually look like. Hold on, let me find a better skull. There has to be one lying around here somewhere. Very funny. Seriously though, I need the most pristine Dilophosaurus skull we have. Really? That's the best we've got? So, wait a minute. How do we know its crests actually look like this? We don't. For all we know, the crest on Dilophosaurus could have looked something like this. Or maybe you prefer something a little more to the point. The truth is, we don't really have a great understanding of what these crests actually look like. Which, in my opinion, makes some of these more common designs a bit unimaginative. In fact, this is the perfect area for speculation, and I wish filmmakers would get a bit more creative with them. On top of that, it's reasonable to assume that these crests were probably covered in a layer of keratin. So, why not? Give Dilophosaurus some extra flair, because then we would end up with dinosaurs that look like this? Hehe, <laughs> I kinda like it. But, I see your point. Since keratin doesn't preserve as well as bone, trying to recreate that is mostly guesswork, and we all know how well that turns out. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret. Part of me wants to believe that these crests were not covered in any keratin at all. Why is that? Because we've discovered something really interesting about the crest of these animals. But to see what that is, we'll need to flip the fossil over. When we take a look at the interior side of the crest, we can see that there are several divots along the interior side. This means that the crest on Dilophosaurus might have contained air sacs. Air sacs? Oh, right. You humans don't have those. Air sacs play a vital role in the respiratory system of birds, crocs, and dinosaurs. And as you'll soon see, it's a much better system. Go ahead and take a deep breath. As you do this, you can feel your lungs filling up with air. This is important because, holy cow, you can exhale! Sorry about that. Now, when your lungs are filled with air, your body pulls in oxygen. This process fuels your body and plays a direct role in how much energy you can use. Now, you know what happens when you exhale all that air? I'll tell you what doesn't happen. Your lungs aren't being supplied with fresh oxygen, that's for sure. But of course not. After all, we have to exhale. We can't just leave all that carbon dioxide in there. We need to breathe out so we can breathe in new air. Not if you have air sacs. I'm sorry. If you have air sacs, you can simply replenish that air, right? Isn't that exactly how lungs work? Not exactly, but maybe it'll make more sense if I draw it out. On the left, we have a healthy set of lungs. When we breathe in, air enters the lungs and oxygen is pulled from the air. Then, when you breathe out, your lungs empty until you breathe in again. Now compare that to a respiratory system of an animal with air sacs. When they breathe in, that air doesn't go into the lungs. Instead, the air enters an air sac. Then, when they exhale, that air leaves the air sac and enters... Let's just call these lungs. Then, when they inhale again, instead of leaving the lungs and going back the way it came, the air enters a posterior air sac. Finally, when they exhale a second time, the air is removed from the body. Wow, napkin. I thought you said this system was better. That sounds like a lot of extra steps compared to just breathing in and out. How is that four step monstrosity a better system? Because each step is happening at the same time. Let's look at both of these systems again, but this time we'll show what's happening as these animals breathe in and out. You see how the mammalian system is in and out while the air sac system allows for a continuous supply of oxygen to the body? This system provides the body with more energy and almost certainly played a crucial role in the rise of dinosaurs. But let's get back to those crests. I mentioned earlier that I would love it if we could say for certain that these crests didn't contain a layer of keratin over them. Why did I say that? Well, not having a layer of keratin over them would allow the crest to expand and contract, similar to how a prairie chicken puffs out their chest as part of its mating ritual. 
I love this idea. How cool would it be to have a dinosaur with an inflatable crest it could puff in and out on top of its head? I can't think of any other animal that does that. Hmm. I can't think of any other animal that does that. I guess that is kind of a bit of a red flag. Not to mention, we do have modern birds with crests such as the cassowary and their crests are covered with a thick layer of keratin. I hadn't thought about that. I guess having an airbag on top of your head might pose some issues. Now, just because we found evidence that the Lophosaurus had a more prominent crest on its head and a stronger bite than we initially thought, doesn't mean that all our initial assumptions were wrong. I mentioned earlier that one of our first impressions of Dilophosaurus was that it must have relied on its arms for taking down its prey. And there's some strong evidence to that. Let me introduce you to UCMP 37302, or as his mother calls him, Lucky. Lucky was one of those original three Dilophosaurus found in 1942, and it would go on to be the holotype specimen. This means that we use Lucky's fossils as the de facto fossils for Dilophosaurus. Our buddy's a star, and Lucky had an interesting life. Have you ever had a bad day? You're tired, your head hurts, and you can't have any more snacks because apparently too much candy and not drinking enough water is giving you a headache. Lies, I tell you. Well, Lucky didn't just have a bad day. Lucky had what you would call a bad life. You see how he's holding up his finger because he's number one? Well, that's not on purpose. While Lucky is undoubtedly number one in our hearts, he's not trying to broadcast it. His finger is permanently stuck in that position. In addition to his finger, his right forearm was also stuck at a weird angle meaning he couldn't bring his right arm to his chest like this. Wow, now I feel really bad about earlier. Thankfully, Lucky did have a good arm. His right arm was- Wait, what? Didn't we just talk about the right arm? If that's his good arm, then what's going on with the other one? The left arm had several fractures, one on the claw, one on the forearm, and one on the shoulder. In addition to the fractures, the left arm also had several puncture wounds that were likely received from another animal, possibly another Dilophosaurus. But don't worry, Lucky survived all these wounds. Oh, thank God. We know this because some of the wounds wound up infected. Why? Did I mention the animal also had tumors and possibly bone cancer? Anything else? Oh, because the specimen is half the size of the one we found in 1964, we believe Lucky also died while he was still a juvenile. Okay, maybe my day isn't so bad after all. Tell me about it. Lucky sure had a rough life. But it makes you wonder. If Lucky wasn't able to use both its arms and it had so many injuries, how did it survive as long as it did? Well, paleontologists have an interesting hypothesis on this, and I think it explains just how this animal was able to survive as long as it did. You see, Lucky wasn't the only dinosaur to sustain injuries that made it difficult to hunt. Another famous theropod also managed to survive, despite having a seemingly life-threatening injury. But unfortunately, we're out of time, so I guess we'll have to leave the tail of my favorite T-Rex for another video. Until then, I want to thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, please subscribe to my channel, and don't forget to bring snacks.